And we're going to be going through the book of Nehemiah. So if you would find Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an Old Testament book. If you can find the book of Psalms, which is just about in the middle of your Bible, and if you find Psalms, start turning towards the front cover. All right? From Psalms, you will, find, you will come to the book of Job. Keep turning towards the front cover. And then before Job, you'll come to the book of Esther. Keep turning towards the front cover. And the next book is Nehemiah. So it goes Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. Um, chronologically, Nehemiah is one of the uh, most recent books of the Old Testament. It's one of the last books of the Old Testament written. And so we can just kind of understand where this fits. Let me give you a short history lesson. When the nation of Israel came out of slavery to Egypt, uh, they were led in the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before being led into the land that God had promised to Israel. And when they entered into that promised land, things went quite well for Israel for a while until poor leadership caused the nation of Israel to divide into two nations. The northern nation consisted of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, and that nation retained the name Israel. The southern nation, made up of the two remaining tribes of Israel, took the name of Judah. And both Israel and Judah drifted away from God. But Israel drifted harder and faster. And so true to his word, in 722 BC, God allowed the Assyrians to come and capture the northern nation of Israel and carry them away. And they've pretty much disappeared. Judah also continued to drift, and so in 586 B.C., God allowed the Babylonians to come and capture Judah. And in capturing Judah, the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple and wiped out the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonians killed many of the people, but they also carried many back to Babylon in captivity, where those people remained for 70 years until a new king arrived on the scene. During those 70 years, the Medo-Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian Empire. And when they de defeated the Babylonians, they inherited all of Babylon's captives, which would mean these people from Judah. Cyrus was the king of Persia. And when they defeated the Babylonians, Cyrus told the people of Judah that they had permission to go back to Judah if they wanted to. And the Old Testament book of Ezra tells us about many of those groups of people returning to Judah and how they rebuilt the temple. But the city was still in disrepair. The city walls were still broken down. And city walls are for the purpose of protection. And so the people living in the city or working in the city or going to the temple to worship in the city, they felt unsafe. They felt vulnerable. And that's the situation as we begin the book of Nehemiah. I believe Nehemiah is one of the four greatest leaders in the Bible. Clearly, Jesus is the greatest leader who has ever lived. Jesus started a movement, we call it Christianity, that has turned the world upside down and inside out and made the world a better place for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Another great leader in the Bible is Moses. And from Moses, we learn the importance of delegation and trust. Another great leader in the Bible is Barnabas. And from Barnabas, we learn the importance of investing in and building up people. But from Nehemiah, we learn a number of great leadership lessons. And the leadership lesson that we are going to discover this morning is that leaders face facts, but never lose hope. Leaders face facts, but never lose hope. So if you are there in the book of Nehemiah, let's read the first few verses. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. 
Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah is in the citadel in Susa. Susa was the city where Persian kings would go during winter. And we're told here at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah that this is happening in the month of Kislev. Kislev. That would be our November, December, the end of November and the beginning of December. So it's winter. And we're told that he is here in Susa in a citadel, which means a fortified palace. And the reason Nehemiah is here in this fortified palace with the king is because, as we'll see in a few verses, Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king, meaning that he would taste test all of the king's wine and food to make sure that it hadn't been poisoned. Nehemiah was a captive slave, but he had become a trusted servant. And so while Nehemiah is there, His brother, Hanani, comes back from Jerusalem. When Cyrus allowed the people of Judah to return to Judah, many of them did, not all of them did, but there was freedom to travel, and so people would go back and forth between Jerusalem or Judah and back up into this territory, which is now held by the Medo-Persian Empire. It was over 750 miles. It was a trip that would take these people several months. But people were going back and forth. And Hanani returns from being in Jerusalem, and he travels with some people. And so Nehemiah asks him, what is the condition there? How how are the people of Judah doing, and what's the condition of the city of Jerusalem? And here we see the first part of this leadership lesson, that leaders face facts but never lose hope. And the necessary part of this is that a good leader gets the facts. A good leader gets the facts. Nehemiah asks how the people are and what the condition of the city is. Good leaders do not make decisions based on feeling. They might move based on intuition, but they do not make decisions based on feelings. They get the facts. They do the research. And Nehemiah is humble enough to get the information and to ask the opinions of others so he can know what is reality. And what they said is bad news. They said that uh, these who had survived the exile, and by the way, many people did not survive the exile. And so these are people who were strong. These are people who were tough. These were people who had been through difficult things. And now they've returned to Judah and the city of Jerusalem, but they are still in great trouble and disgrace because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. To say that they are in great trouble means that they are struggling with adversity. There's calamity. There's harm. To say that they are experiencing disgrace means that they are being shamed. It means that they're being ridiculed. They're under reproach. It means that they are being mocked and made fun of. And so these people, whether they are living in the city of Jerusalem or working in the city of Jerusalem or just returning to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, there are no walls. And so they are vulnerable and open to attack. And there are no city gates, so they can't prevent anybody from entering into the city. So they feel vulnerable. They feel like they could be attacked at any moment. And the enemies around the city are mocking them and making fun of them and intentionally scaring them. Leadership doesn't begin by seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. But neither does leadership begin with pessimism. Leadership gets the facts. Good leadership begins with having the facts so you know reality. This is the way things really are. It might be great. It might be horrible. 
It might be somewhere in between, but you have to know the facts in order to be able to lead forward from here. And as we see with Nehemiah, and as is often true for us, we need to ask others for information. We need to ask others their opinion in order that we can accurately know the facts. Well, in the rest of our passage for today, we are going to see four responses of godly leaders. Once they have the information, once they have the facts, what do they do? You see, there's a lot of people who know the facts, but they don't go on to become leaders. Why? Because a, a leader does something with the information they have. A leader moves forward from that point. And as we're going to see here, there are four responses that not only make Nehemiah a good leader, but they make Nehemiah a godly leader. The first response of a godly leader is that a godly leader prays. So let's keep reading. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. He says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah learned the facts, but Nehemiah wasn't cold to the facts. It says that when Nehemiah discovered the facts, he sat down and he wept. And I can almost Picture Nehemiah doing this, hearing about what the people are experiencing and, and what the condition is of the city. I can almost picture Nehemiah sitting down and putting his head in his hands and weeping. And he says here that he, he lamented, he, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed for many, many days. And he gives us a summary here of what he prayed. He begins his prayers by praising God. That's verse 5. And then he confesses the sins of God's people, including Nehemiah's. That's verses 6 and 7. After that, he claims the promises of God in verses 8 through 10. And then in verse 11, Nehemiah makes his requests. And this is perhaps what differentiates secular leaders from spiritual leaders the most. Secular leaders seem to lead out of their intelligence and out of their strategy and out of their charisma. But spiritual leaders lead depending on the Lord. Leaders, by definition, are people who are movers and shakers. And so oftentimes, godly leaders struggle in their prayer life because it can seem like they aren't doing the most productive thing. But as we see here with Nehemiah, and as we see with Jesus, and as we see with Moses, they are praying. And praying is a productive thing. Praying is a productive thing. Uh, Henry Blackaby, in his book, Spiritual Leadership, mentions six important reasons leaders need to be praying. First, nothing of spiritual significance happens without God. So pray. Second, Spiritual leaders need to lead being filled with the Holy Spirit. So pray. Third, to lead well, we need wisdom, and God is the giver of wisdom. So pray. Fourth, God is all-powerful. 
So to accomplish the big things God desires of us, we need to pray. Fifth, prayer is the leader's best remedy for stress. So pray. And six, God reveals his plan and his schedule through prayer. So pray. Leaders face facts, but never lose hope. Nehemiah knew the real situation of the city of Jerusalem and of the people in Judah, but Nehemiah was a man of prayer, and he believed in a better future. And so he prayed, trusting that God would reveal his will and his plans to him. Second thing that godly leaders do in response is they wait. They wait. (laughs) Nehemiah's prayer ends very clearly that he has a sense that God is going to do something through him. Because he says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, meaning the king. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Let's just stop there. The Bible says, He who waits upon the Lord will renew his strength. That means that God's timing is best. So oftentimes, the wisest thing we can do is just wait for God's timing. Nehemiah's story began in the winter. Remember, it was the month of Kislev, November, December. Chapter 2 starts in the month of Nisan, which is the end of our April. So Nehemiah has been waiting for four to five months. What's he been doing during those four to five months? He's been praying and waiting. He's been praying and waiting. He's been praying and waiting. We aren't people who like to wait, are we? You sit in front of your computer screen and that little circle goes around two or three times, you get frustrated, right? You uh, put a cup of coffee in the microwave to heat it up and you start to tap your toe and it just takes 45 seconds. Okay, you're in a traffic line and, and if the light turns green and the car in front of you doesn't immediately take off, you tap your horn, right? We just do not like to wait. We like to move. We like action. We like to see things happen. But poor leadership is getting ahead of God. Biblically, waiting never means being passive. Biblically, waiting is always active. But it is acting doing God things, not my things. Waiting requires patience, trust, faith, hope. A third thing that godly leaders do, is they volunteer. They volunteer. Leaders are leaders because they want to be a part of the solution. They face the facts, but they want to help things to improve. They want to be part of the solution. The first requirement of church leaders is they have to want to serve. So look at verse chapter 2. We're going to go back to the beginning of verse 1 again, down through verse 5. It says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Kings don't want to be surrounded by Eeyores. Remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Oh, Pooh. It's a wonderful day. Kings don't want to be surrounded by people who are sad and upset and angry and unhappy. Kings want to be surrounded by people who are excited and people who are happy and people who are satisfied. And Nehemiah has not been giving any indication that he's upset until this day. 
And on this day, Artaxerxes notices the look on Nehemiah's face. And so he asks Nehemiah, what's wrong? And don't you love Nehemiah's honesty? He said, I was very much afraid. Why? Because being unhappy in the presence of the king usually meant that you were put to death. But Nehemiah had been praying, and Nehemiah had been trusting, and Nehemiah had been waiting for God's timing. And all of a sudden, he has a sense that the Spirit of God is moving here, that God is opening a door. Nehemiah recognizes this is the moment. And so he tells Artaxerxes that the reason he's sad is because his mind is in Judah, and his heart is broken over what those people are having to endure and broken over the condition of God's holy city. Well, then the last thing. Godly leaders make plans. Godly leaders make plans. Continue reading. Verses 6 through 10. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. You know that God honors order and a plan? God honors order and a plan. So during the months while Nehemiah was praying and waiting, praying and waiting, he was also thinking and planning. By the way, that in itself is a demonstration of faith, isn't it? If you don't believe God is going to answer your prayer, why plan? If you don't think God is going to move, why plan? If you don't think God is up to the task, why plan? But when Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah questions, Nehemiah has answers because he has been planning. Some people think that trusting God means just flying by the seat of your pants. But that's not the case. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. That, that word for commit your work to the Lord, it means roll that off of your shoulders and roll that onto God. And when you do that, when you unburden yourselves and you lay that on God, he says your plans will be established. The word plan has in its definition the idea of forethought. Strategy. Jesus talked about a man who was about to build a tower, and he says the man didn't put any planning or forethought into it, so he didn't have enough money to complete the project. Jesus talked about a king who was about to go out and do battle, but he didn't plan, he didn't think about whether or not his soldiers would be able to defeat the enemy's soldiers. God honors order and plan. He honors prayerfully made Holy Spirit-guided planning. So when Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah what is wrong, Nehemiah sees it as an indication of God's timing. And so Nehemiah tells him that he's upset. And then the king asked him, what is it that you want to do? And it says that Nehemiah sends up what I call a bullet prayer, right? Just one of those, oh Lord, help me. You ever prayed one of those? I sure have. And he sends up this bullet prayer. Um, and he answers and he says, please let me go to Jerusalem so I can rebuild it. So I can rebuild it. But Nehemiah had planned way beyond, I just want to get there and do something. He planned way beyond that. The king asks Nehemiah how long he will be gone. And Nehemiah has figured out how long it will take him to travel from Susa to Jerusalem how long it will take him to repair the wall, and how long it will take him to travel back to Susa. Nehemiah has thought this through. But now, clearly, Nehemiah sees that God is in this, that the Spirit of God is moving, that the door of opportunity has opened. And so, even beyond that, Nehemiah says to the king, 
uh, would you also give me letters for safe travel so that I can move about freely, so that nobody will attack me because I have a letter from you saying that I have your permission. And even beyond that, he asks the king to provide the lumber to rebuild the walls and the city gates and enough lumber to build a house for Nehemiah to live in while he's there in Jerusalem. And the king agrees. And beyond that, the king sent army officers and cavalry to accompany Nehemiah on his journey for protection. So here we are, we're just a chapter and a half into the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, and already we're seeing these important leadership lessons. But before we wrap up, I just want you to notice one other thing. Look at verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Nehemiah was a man of God. He was going to serve on a godly mission. He was leading God's way. But this verse is an indication that there's going to be opposition. <laughs> These two guys, Sanballat and Tobiah, we are going to see that they cause Nehemiah headaches all the way through Nehemiah's story. Well, I hope you're beginning to love and appreciate Nehemiah the way I do. Whenever, whenever you are in circumstances, whenever you are in a situation, whenever you see facts, and you know it's not the way it's supposed to be, this is not according to God's word, this is not according to God's will, learn from Nehemiah what you should do. He prayed. He waited, he volunteered, and he planned. Next week, we're going to learn from Nehemiah the importance of team building. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Nehemiah, that this book is in the Bible, these important lessons, because everything rises and falls on leadership. We need to be leading in our families. Maybe we have leadership responsibilities in the workplace. Father, the church needs good leadership. Nations need good leaders. And so th this isn't just interesting stuff to pack away in the back of our head. This is information that we need to apply and put into practice. Thank you that Jesus is the greatest leader of all. And he led by going to the cross, by dying for our sins, and by being raised from the dead. And I pray if there's somebody here who isn't following his leading, that they would step out and make a decision to receive Christ today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.